Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Play to Win Hero Clicks Podcast. This is Jared Buffington, aka Galactic Overlord. Uh, I just saw a bunch of stuff today, and I usually only do shows when I went to a tournament, but I saw a lot of content, and I know most of the shows already did their episodes, so we'll probably get to talk about some of the stuff first. Uh, so we got a couple things we're going to talk about. Um, we didn't talk about the, the ROC US Vegas Cup. We got the new results from the, the German Nationals, which is awesome. Um, and I also want to do the first of a segment that I think I'm going to call Joe's School of Hero Clicks, which is uh, the guy who really mentored me in Hero Clicks, Joe Alves, or... Uh, you see him in the top eight things, his full name, Josafa Jesus, or Jesus, uh, but we call him Joe. Uh, and what he kind of taught me are the basic principles of the game, to be competitive, at least. And uh, I wanted to go through that because I got some guys that I'm training how to play for the first time, and I've been going over this with them, and I feel like some of the stuff a lot of people need to know. Even though some of it's been covered in the Majestics um, page, which if you really want to be serious, I suggest that you subscribe to that page because there's just so much information on there. But everybody's not subscribed to that. So um, we're going to go over it step by step in these podcasts. So... um, Number one, the the ROC US Vegas Cup. I liked it. I did not uh, view all the stuff or get all the information before the last podcast, even though I think it was available. Um, The two things that I really liked, well, there's actually three things. One, Krang was played there, which Krang didn't win. I don't think it made top four. And uh, but that's the first time we've seen Krang in a little while, so you still have to think about Krang when building your team, it's not completely dead. Um, but in truth, when somebody plays Krang or Lex Luthor, they basically decided, you know what, I'm not gonna think about it, I don't have all the pieces to play the Quinn yet, so I'm just gonna play one of these two teams because it makes top eight. Uh, for the most part. So when you see somebody show up with Krang or Lex Luthor, you know, okay, they just didn't want to think about it. And they wanted to get some ROC points for the most part. Um, so, but what I did like was the double Nick team. Nick Fury is probably my favorite piece ever. And I say that because I've won so many games with Nick Fury. And I remember when he first came out and I got him like remember just crazy games where like at my local um, shop where Nick Fury's taking out King Thor and taking down these big like powerhouse pieces and all the arguments with between power cosmic and can't use (laughs) and stuff like that so I love Nick Fury Um, so when I see anybody play competitive I really take note when they play him at full and this guy, I forget his name, but he played two Knicks and two War Wheels, the the Wheels of Nick team. And it was awesome. Because really the only thing better than one Nick Fury is two Nick Furies. So I really liked it that he played. And he was just taking out some teams. And the game that he played against the guy Kevin, he really could have won that also. But... Uh, he messed up and pushed when he had Earthbound Neutralize on the Nick Fury. And there was a time where he said can't use and then wanted to like sidestep. And, and Kevin, the guy was saying, well, you already can't use this, so you can't move him. When he could have just, okay, I take back the can't use and use it on something different, you know. Um, yeah, so he really had a good chance of winning. I really like that Nick Fury team. Um the Mr. Mitzelplicker Frogman. And I remember when the set first came out and Joe saw Frogman, Joe was like, this piece 
has my name written all over it. This frog man is crazy. Um, which he is crazy. You're getting all that damage. If you can outwit, you know, whatever combat reflexes or, you know, toughness and knock people into walls and the combination with Mitzelplik, I mean, it is great. It's like really filling the void of the blind owl. Because his team, if you didn't watch it, it's I think it's Kevin Afruz won the U.S. Cup. And it was Mitzelplik, Frogman, um, two Ultron drones, the Round Table, Fast Forces Jean Grey, and I think that's it. And he would push Mitzi to get him onto his click number two um, with the Pulse Wave and would just use the Ultron drones to call out people and and stuff like that and I think it caught everybody you know caught everybody off guard and they didn't know what to think of that team especially Frogman has five clicks at 35 points so people want to well I'm just going to take out Frogman and they end up having to attack him twice instead of once and that really throws off the momentum of the game um and watching him play Kevin Afruz is a really great player all around really making the right moves um, but I would say this, the, the most, the most influential reason of why he won that is because this notion and this, when you're building teams nowadays, this is something that's super powerful. And if you can do this, uh, you're going to catch people who are just playing autopilot teams or just playing teams, net decking, and, um, they don't aren't really skilled players because there's a difference between an okay player playing a tested team that's really good or a really good player there's a different nuance there um and if you've been playing a long time you know what i'm talking about like when i see saw easton brock beat the quinjet with taskmaster you can tell okay uh I, I think that Easton is just a really good player. Is he going to beat Patrick with the Quinjet? I think it's not going to go as easily. But a less experienced player with the Quinjet, yeah, I think he's going to beat him because you just can't make up for being a good player. And what he did with this team is he made it so that as the opponent, you're questioning yourself. You're saying, who do I target? It's kind of like his team had two things going on at once. It had the Mitzelplik Pulse Wave, but then it also had Jean Grey TKing out the Ultron, Ultron drones. And uh, before I forget, he was playing two Atoms also at the class, Colossal Retaliation Click. And so he had these two things going on where, okay, he has the Ultron drones, but he also has this Mitzelplik. And then he has this frogman going around doing things. And I don't know who to commit to attacking. Because the Ultron drone, I'm not going to get the pump with Nick. I'm going to have to deal out at least four damage on the Ultron drone. And it's only 30 points. So do I waste my Nick Fury on an Ultron drone? Or do I waste an ID call in on an Ultron drone? Or do I target Mitzelplik and have to hit an 18 or a 19 from range because of the tiny? Uh, plus, Mitzelplik has a dice over on the side. And it just makes things hard for the average player, for any player really, of how do I calculate threat assessment? And I think that a lot of the teams now, and you're going to see this strategy develop more and more, is uh, it's going to confuse threat assessment for the average player uh, I think it was Patrick Yapoko who talked about it once and he said one of the things that he does is he sits down and immediately looks at their team and looks at his team and computes what his team needs to do to win and what their team needs to do to win and commits to that that initial threat assessment and um, for the average player uh, it's not going to be easy to do that when players have two things going on. It's kind of like 
hip hop a, a few years ago, it had this little phase where every song, like really good song, had two beats. Like it was like the whole Drake album had one beat for most of the song, and then it would change into a second beat somewhere in the song. And the Hero Clicks teams are kind of looking like that now, the really competitive ones of, I have two things going on, I have two beats going on in this song, and it's really hard to um, commit to the threat assessment. Especially, you're going to see people playing this Devil Dinosaur, and a third of the team is going to be Devil Dinosaur. And you're going to be thinking, do I commit to hitting Devil Dinosaur four times? Because he has three of those little clicks, then a stop click, and then you got to hit him for the rest of his damage. So do I commit to four attacks on this 100-point figure to try and stop this Pog Madness? Or do I go after the rest of the team, which might just be Ultron drones and other things, and maybe not get enough points? And I think that that little cloak of confusion really takes players out of the game. Uh, and I think that that's what Kevin Afruit's team did. And I think that's what you got to look at. If I'm playing Kevin Afruit's team, uh, I think off the rip, if I can get a high attack, like I got perplexes and stuff, and I can get a high attack, or I got two probs, I'm going to take out Mitzelplik, just period. And if I can't do that, if I didn't roll for perplex on the box or whatever, or I can't get the shot at Mitzelplik, uh, I'm definitely going after the Ultron drone that, that doesn't have any action tokens. And you kind of have to do that uh, to take out a team like that, but it's hard you know, to decide and kind of keep your head in the game when teams are built like that. So that's what I liked. I liked seeing Mitzelplik. Um, Mitzelplik's also one of my favorite figures. But I really like that Nick team, and I think that Nick team has a lot of potential being that soldier theme team. Um, yep. And did you see, and if you saw that double Nick team play against a Krang team, it made Krang just look like an awful piece. It was like Krang ran up, killed a war wheel, ran back, and then Nick said, okay, you know, pow, pow. Then Krang's dead. I think that game was like a 16-minute game. It was such a short game. Um, it was awesome. So the other thing, German Nationals. I just saw the list today for the top eight of German nationals and Quinjet won. How about that people? Quinjet won. Uh, Cause there's been a lot of talk of Quinjet has not won a major tournament since worlds with Patrick Yapoko. Uh, and I think that that's mostly because the people have been like doing different builds, like weird builds and also the quality of, of the player with threat assessment has a lot to do with it also. Um, I'm seeing more and more Patrick really wrote the framework for the Quinjet. The Avengers theme team Quinjet, that's nice. But when the Quinjet's the only player calling out figures, it really limits what you can do. I mean, having those two Ultrons as threats, uh, again, it kind of brings that confusion to the players because they say, do I commit to killing the Jet or do I take my time picking off these two 30-point characters? And I think that that element of the team really makes it run. Uh, this guy had two Ultron drones. He had Jarvis, the Quinjet at full and nine ID cards and he was playing Wonder Woman as an ID card and I think he had another strange one um, but Wonder Woman was one of the nine ID cards he used and the team was actually good he didn't start off with a retaliate piece on the board he had the Adam coming in through ID card uh, and he so that he could keep the Jarvis and the two Ultron drones and he won and I think that I like the Jarvis with the two Ultron drones because having that ninth ID card 
I think that's something you really have to look at because I've been in games where with the Quinjet I've used three or four of the call-ins for offense because remember two of the call-ins are really dedicated to building momentum for the Jet with the Iron Man at 50 points, the one with the Perplex, and the Atom. Which the Atom still puts out offense, but they're not two of the big, you know, hitters trying to take out a piece, really, even though it helps. The Iron Man gives the sidestep and the perplex, which is so important for the repositioning. But that leaves you with only six options for ID characters throughout the game. And if someone can kill one of your ID characters and you're, you know, mostly through your six characters and you only have Red Tornado on the sideline, you're kind of in some trouble. And that hurts. So having another a ninth ID card character, which I think the best option would be Ronin. I think that Ronin's vicious, and that's the thing that Kevin Afroos did at the U.S. Cup. When he pulled out that Ronin and he said he had charged flurry blades, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That is crazy. Um, I think that Ronin's a great ninth ID card. Because if you start breaking the ID card mold um, too much from the eight ID cards, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna suffer. You're gonna lose something. Uh, I think you really need to stick to that mold. The only thing I think that is a variable is sometimes people play Black Canary and sometimes people play um, Trinity Wars Batman. You're choosing between those, and then you're also choosing: Am I going to use? Trinity Wars Green Arrow or the 85 point LE Green Arrow and I like the 135 point Green Arrow I don't care if I got to use the jet for it because that thing is just nasty it's just nastier than the other one and um, and I like Trinity Wars Batman over Black Canary because Trinity Wars Batman you get the three major powers you get perplex, outwit, and prop. And if you need to, you can pick range combat expert or close combat expert. I mean, that Batman can put in some work at the 85 point um, line. So I really like the Batman. Um, what else was played? Oh, the guy played two living lightnings. Let me look up exactly what he played here. Because this was crazy. He played... Two Living Lightnings, Quicksilver, and Manifold. Avengers theme team, which is awesome. And people that are really up on the... Um, people that are really up on the competitive clicks... When we're thinking about Living Lightning, we're just waiting on somebody to actually try it. Because Living Lightning, he does damage to Quinjet teams. He does damage to robot teams. He kills Ultron drones. Uh, he's really a force to be reckoned with, especially if you get some perplex. And I am excited that somebody played him. It's not my style to play that um, because... That's a team that I think, even though Krang has the robot keyword, I think Krang can kill that team because he's going to go across the board. He's going to take out a Living Lightning. He's going to come back. He's going to heal up, heal up, and probably get a chance to either take out Quicksilver or the second Living Lightning before they really get to sink their teeth into Krang. So, but I'm just glad somebody played it. I mean, I think that's awesome. Uh turtles there was two teenage mutant ninja turtles theme teams one all the 50 point turtles and the turtle van at 60 with pandora's box wow with four cents and two id cards and they won third place that is awesome <laughs> that is, i took a look at the turtle van and it basically heals the turtles or gives them boosts like plus one attack plus one damage type of stuff and that's awesome 
for them to make it up that high, the player had to be really good, or it had that effect again of, I don't know what to do, do I attack the turtle van, I'm not sure what the turtle van does, or do I try to pick off these little ninja turtles, you know, what do I do, so that effect is crazy, another, the other theme team played uh, Splinter instead of Pandora's box and the ID cards, Splinter at 40 points, so that's awesome, oh, the soldier theme team, was also Nick Fury and Captain Adam Prime. I've thought about playing that Captain Adam Prime with Nick Fury so many times. So many times. I just haven't done it. Um, what I really also have been thinking about is Nick Fury and Red Sun Superman at 100 points. Because that's a soldier theme team. And Red Sun Superman has two stop clicks. The only thing is Pulse Wave gets through those stop clicks, but um, that's a theme team that i kind of been looking at with Nick Fury. Um, probably Nick Fury, Red Sun, Superman, that's 220, plus uh, either Rock of Eternity on Nick or Pandora's Box, and... That's 240, and then, you know, you can still play Peggy Carter. Or you could play General Lane and some ID cards, which General Lane's just nasty. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on Soldier Theme Team. You're welcome for building your teams. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, somebody played the Iceman. Oh, Iceman, Quicksilver, Jean Grey. That's cool. Somebody played KC Flash and got fourth place. KC Flash, 50 point Storm, 35 point KC Spectre, a Doctor Strange ID card, and an Iron Man ID card. That is awesome. I love that KC Flash piece just so much, just based off of just GP, just how it looks and the fact that it's the Flash. And I hope that thing goes back up to 60, 90 bucks, whatever it was worth before. Uh, if you remember when it was limited format ROC and somebody played KC Flash and a bunch of the lower dial ones uh, and the, the price skyrocketed back up on the KC Flash, I hope it skyrockets again because uh, I love that piece. I love it, I love it, I love it. Um, the next thing that I had to talk about was the Starting Over podcast from Edward Shelton, Dark Logos. He had a podcast, his most recent one, where he talked about Chameleon and possible um, ways of thinking with Chameleon and how to kind of build your sideboard with Chameleon. And I wanted to add one thing. You should go listen to that podcast, by the way. It's the newest one. It's Search YouTube Starting Over Podcast. Um, but another thing that which I want to tell you all, I think one of the best options, like offensive options for Chameleon, is the 45-point Winter Soldier from the Civil War Fast Forces. I know it sounds crazy that you're going to trade the 70-point character for the 45-point character, but if you need the offensive option, he has 8 range. 8 range. And you know 8 is the new 10 the way the game is now. He has sidestep. He has range combat expert with two damage. He also has 11 attack blade claws and fangs. So whether from range or from close combat, he has awesome stats and the ability to crank out a bunch of damage. So I think that switching out Chameleon when you need to KO a figure... Or you need to hit a uh, attack on a high defense because that range combat expert, excuse me, gets his attack up to a 13. I think Winter Soldier is one of the best options, in my opinion, for Chameleon. And I think when, when you're building with Chameleon, which I'm really interested to hear Patrick talk about it or Aaron Cantu talk about it uh, or even Edward Shelton talk about team building with chameleon because 
the sideboard you be you build with Chameleon is really going to have to be with the mindset of what is the team missing that Chameleon is on. Because if you already have a bunch of offense, then you might go super defense, super support with Chameleon. If your team uh, is missing some offense, then you might put Winter Soldier on there. You might put... Um, What's it called? Uh, I think Katana might be 60 points. I'm not sure with the the Flurry Blades or uh, Triathlon or, um, you know, Shang, Shang-Chi. No, Shang-Chi 73 points. But you might put super offensive versions, which it might sound crazy, but there are some offensive versions um, with the 60 point and down limit that can just get one good hit in even Peggy can kind of be offense um or you're gonna go super control like you're gonna put a Peggy you're gonna put a general lane you're gonna put uh something like that to make it control or you're gonna do balance you're gonna put a Peggy you're gonna put a winter soldier and you're gonna put uh I don't know, somebody else with um, Proper Perplex, put the Wizard or put uh, even that 45 point Mephisto that has the ability to give your team Prob and also Perplex. Um, so that's how I think you got to think about Chameleon is what is the team doing that Chameleon is on and how can it, can it be helped best. Uh, I really like balanced teams. So, I would kind of put, you know, Peggy, Winter Soldier, and then the third one would really be dependent on what's missing, whether it's a Mephisto, whether it's the Wizard, whether it is, heck, Frogman can do some stuff. You know, Frogman could help. At the right time, somebody has energy shield deflection, and you push them off elevated terrain for two clicks. I mean, that can be nasty. So I think that's how you think about it. I just wanted to add my two cents with Chameleon and the sleeper, the secret pick of Winter Soldier. So you're welcome. Uh, for the last part, not the last part, but one of the last things. So for Joe's School of Hero Clicks, and I call it Joe's School of Hero Clicks because he's the one who really mentored me um, and being competitive with Hero Clicks. One of the first things that you need for building a team and team building to be competitive is you need the big three say that with me big three there's three powers that you need on your team in every team you need access to these three powers and that is probability control perplex and outwit probability control perplex and outwit there was a Majestics article I think Patrick did that said something like this where you needed, you know, these three elements. I'm not sure if he said all three elements, but I think he did. But Joe was the first one who told it to me a couple of months before that article came out. And it's so true. you got to have access to all three of those powers. And with so much quintessence and powers can't be countered, you almost need not outwit, but you need a can't use whether that's a shield level 7 to call in Peggy Carter or a shield level 7 to call in Nick where they can just shut off a power even if the person's not quintessent. Even if the person is quintessent, you can shut off a power and get around whatever defense power or energy shield or combat reflexes to help you connect. So you got to have that. You got to have perplex because you got to be able to crank out enough damage. If you can't uh, have a damage output of six damage per turn, then your team's not going to be top tier. That might sound crazy, but it's true. you got to be able to crank out six clicks of damage per turn. If you're not able to do that, then your team is going to have some difficulties 
when you're playing against a top tier player or a top tier team. You got to be able to dish out six clicks of damage. Um, probability control. Uh, Phil Jr., which some of you know who Phil Jr. is. I think he won Canadian Nationals once. I think he's won U.S. Nationals before. Uh, he won the Florida State Championship this year. Uh, I, I talked to him of, of what's you know the most important part of the game, and, and this is what Phil Jr. said. He said, dice control is the most important part of the game. He said, have as much prob as possible. So this is from a top-tier player. Uh, he might not be in your top five list, uh, but he'll be in the top ten list or top 15 list of anybody who really follows the game. Uh, and he says that the most important part of the game is dice control and probability control. It's the one element that um, no matter how good your strategy is, no matter how good your sequencing is, dice can come to bite you. So you need as much dice control as possible so that you don't let chance determine the outcome of the game. And if you listen to my last podcast when I had Casey Wonder Woman trying to kill a 200 point war machine I had 13 attack on a 17 defense all I needed was a 4 to win the game and I roll a 3 um, dice control is you know everything whether it's from Mitzelplik, uh whether it's from Prob whether you got the Spectre on the team or from Nick Fury you need Prob so new players uh, or maybe players that are just in a rut with their team building you got to think about your team like this. Does this team have access to prob, perplex, and can't use? Because I need those three capabilities. And one of the best outwits, I think, in the game right now is 25-point Solaris. Colossal Retaliate, 10 range, 2 lightning bolts, and outwit. And what people don't realize also is if you just kind of put a relic on it and sidestep up you know every turn and move up then Solaris can start start picking off colossal retaliate pieces because the retaliate pieces can attack other colossals so Solaris is just great at that of you know having some utility there and if you put I think it's greed that gives perplex if you have greed on Solaris, and if you're playing Pandora's box on the path that has prob, then there are some turns that you can have for 25 points, have Solaris as a colossal and 10 range, and can see through stealth, having outwit, perplex, and prob. That's amazing for a 25 point piece. That is absolutely amazing. Um, lastly, I had a breakthrough in my mindset of the game because I even stopped going to a local tournament at one point because they would only play these huge games of 400, 500, 600, 1,000 point golden age theme team and all this stuff. And I had to stop going because I only like to play competitive. And all I wanted to do was practice 300 point meta because I wanted to get better at the game. And when I do something, I get really serious about it. And, you know, I commit to it. And so I only like to play competitive. And whatever I do, I want to go to the top at it. I want to be the best at it. And so Golden Age, never really cared about it at all. Um, but this past week... I, you know, found a new store because I took a, a long trip to Georgia and I uh, had to find a new store to play at while I'm up here. I found a store and I played some Silver Age and some Golden Age and I really saw and understood for the first time how there's some people that, you know, they work full time, they have a family, they love hero clicks, they love comic books and they love the mechanics of the game. But they don't have the time to um, keep up with every ROC list, keep up with the meta, buy new pieces all the time. And Golden Age allows them to kind of, with figures that they 
you know, acquired over a season, they can still play and have fun and really love the game still, even though maybe at this point in their life, they don't have enough time to be competitive. And I really saw that because the attitude of these guys, they weren't just like, um, they weren't like, uh, you know, bashing competitive or saying they're just too good for competitive. They were actually genuinely saying, I want to be competitive. I just don't have the time to keep up with it all. And that really, you know, that honesty really let me see the other side of it. And so I went on a spree this week, man. I trade, I got the, um, old school Galactus, uh, the one from Galactic Guardians. I got the Dormammu, uh, Colossal, cause I love Dormammu. I got the Onslaught Colossal, the, the one from Giant Size X-Men with all the team abilities, the 600 point one. Uh, I got, what's it called? I got uh, Zombie Galactus, Black Lantern, Anti-Monitor. I got Avengers Prime. Just got a bunch of, bunch of good figures that are Golden Age. Um, because I think another reason why I used to not like Golden Age is because the players I would play with, they had like all the good old Avengers pieces. And I'm new and I'm scraping just to get a few of the competitive pieces. But when we play, you know, a thousand point Golden Age, the Avengers are overpowered as crap. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason they call this thing Avengers Clicks. And I would just lose. But now I got a bunch of Avenger Clicks like... Uh, Hulk Buster. I got the, the even though this isn't Golden Age, I got Avengers Assemble, Chase Hulk, Chase Iron Man, um, a bunch of stuff. And so basically, my whiz kid's name is Galactic Overlord, but my local store name is about to be AKA Golden Age Shouty. Because <laughs> I'm about to show up. I'm going to show up to some local game that's Golden Age. I'm going to play Galactus at whatever it is, 300 or 600 points. I'm going to make Nick Fury his herald. And Nick Fury is going to get plus one everything, power cosmic, running shot, um, and flight. And I'm going to tear some stuff up. I can't wait to just walk in and put Galactus on the table. Like, what's up? Um, so, I love Golden Age now. I used to hate Golden Age. But now that I got the pizzas to be able to do it and still have fun and be competitive, um, I love Golden Age. Uh, I really look forward to the day when there's a silver, like a real Silver Age format. Like uh, they were talking about in the Majestics. YouTube channel of where there's kind of a ban list of, you know, 10 to 15 pieces or figures or resources. And, you know, the rest is all up for grabs. Um, really looking forward to that because that will be fun. And then I can play Banshee again uh, and Despotelis. But um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope you guys are doing great. Uh, if you got any better ideas about Chameleon, you got any innovations or better ideas for a Quinjet, uh, or questions, you know, comment, let me know if you hear anything that I say is wrong, you know, let me know because I want to learn, I want to grow, I'm somewhat new at the game still, um, hope you guys have a great rest of the week and remember when you play clicks, you better play to win.